was born in Massachusetts. I'm American. I was born in Massachusetts in um, a town that's a little bit north of Boston called Wakefield, Massachusetts. Hmm. And mostly there's a lot of really good musicians that live in Boston um, because of Berkeley, New England Conservatory, Boston Conservatory. So I didn't realize that when I was young, but I started playing guitar when I was 12. Mm -hmm. And I quickly knew that that was what I wanted to do, which in one way was a really cool thing. But in another way, it was really challenging because I lost interest in most everything else. So I just knew when I was 14 that I was going to play guitar and biology was not <laughs> something I really needed to pay attention to because I knew that. So um, I was really lucky. My first two guitar teachers, they both went to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. So I just decided that I'm going to go to Berkeley College of Music also. And um, I kind of set myself on the way. Mm. You know, at the time when you started taking lessons with these two professors, right, I assumed they were private instructors, right? Exactly. Exactly. What kind of music were you into? And, you know, did they, pre did they prepare some sort of curriculum for you of, you know, strumming or pentatonic scales or, you know, already some heavy stuff? Or did you set up your own education through asking them questions about what it is that you're interested in? I think in the beginning... It was pretty traditional. Um, I was into rock and roll. I was into heavy metal. Um, and I was getting kind of the standard standard stuff, power chords, bar chords, open chords, pentatonics. Um, with my second teacher, which basically I had my first teacher just for a very short time, and then I believe he moved, and then I found his second teacher. And early on with him, I stumbled upon blues music. Mm -hmm. And that was something that really, really resonated with me. And it's a music that's stuck with me till now. I, I really, really love blues music, and I love playing traditional American blues music. And that was an interesting thing, because up till then, I was really into like hard rock and heavy metal bands at the time. But... Through the teacher, I really started to get into stuff like the Yardbirds and Eric Clapton and Jeff Beck and and um, Jimi Hendrix and just straight, you know, more traditional blues stuff. And that was something that was really great. And slowly over time, I started to get more into um, studying music theory and all of these things mm. and starting to kind of work on music on a more serious level. But one thing that was, um, I think was a good thing on one hand, but something that I kind of regret a little bit is I didn't spend so much time learning music kind of note for note or learning tunes. A lot of it, I ended up writing a lot of music. And I think that that's something that's been good for me. My, I've been, you know, kind of, I was always in original bands, kind of playing original music, mm. and this and that, where um, I feel like I kind of got the essence of the things I liked and tried to adapt it into my way of doing it, as opposed to really, really studying it and learning it verbatim. Mm. Mm. Do you remember what age were you when you were transitioning to Berkeley? Or making that yeah. move? Yeah, well... I was 17. Um, I went before I went to Berkeley to study at a college level. I went to the Berkeley five week summer program, mm. which is a, a summer program that's basically for high school kids who are looking to get a little deeper into music or or potentially study on the college level at Berkeley. Um, so it was really interesting. So my junior year of high school, so I was 17. Around that time, there was a high school assembly where we heard the, where the jazz band performed. And at this point, I was pretty much a rock and roll dude. Mm. And, um, but I knew this one drummer who played in the jazz band. And 
I knew he was really good. I'd never heard him play, but the jazz band played, and it was a really good musical director, and they were playing, like, Bob Mintzfer, you know, Big Band Char, mm. you know, really, really hip stuff, really good. And I heard the band play, and I heard my friend who played drums play, and he was studying with Alan Dawson, who's who passed away, but was a very famous um, drum teacher that a lot of great drummers studied with. He played with um, Kenny Barron. He, he's played with a, mil, a million people. He's a legendary drummer. Um, and I was blown away. I was like, wait a second. This is happening right under my nose, and I'm not taking advantage of it. And it was interesting, too, because around the same time, I was dating a girl, and she, her musical taste, she was into some rock stuff, but she was also into things like Sting and Paul Simon and Peter Gabriel. And at this time, that first Sting solo record came out mm. where he's playing with Brantford Marsalis and Kenny Kirkland and Daryl Jones and Omar Hakim. And um, it was Peter Gabriel records and David Bowie's stuff he did in the 80s, which had a lot of really great kind of New York musicians on it. And my taste, I was starting to kind of be really realized there was more I needed to learn. There was more colors. There was more happening. So I had to get really into it. So I went to the Berkeley five week summer program. And I always make the joke that the thing I learned at that summer program was I didn't know anything. <laughs> Everything I thought, because I'd been in a situation where, which I think happens to a lot of younger musicians when you're not like in a major music metropolis is you kind of maybe become the person who everybody's telling you you're really great because there's not that many people playing music and you start to believe it. And then as soon as you get into a bigger pool of people and you start to really see what, where you're really at, it's a, it's a revelation. And you realize <laughs> you have a lot of work to do. That sounds so very familiar. That, <laughs> that was a, yeah, that was the best part of the Berkeley five week summer program. And what was great is my last year of high school, I joined the jazz band and the director of the jazz band, who was also the head of the music department, she organized a, a daily, so five days a week, me and a friend of mine who played trumpet, um, me and her had one class every day of music theory for the whole year, which was amazing. Hmm. Do you remember what you were asked at the audition to go to Berkeley and what did you prepare or how did you prepare for it, for that audition back then? Sure. At that time, um, Berkeley's changed a lot over the years. And at the time when I went, which was in the basically 1989, 1990, mm. there, um, I had good recommendations through the jazz band, through the, um, Institute of Jazz Education, IAJE, mm -hmm. uh, teacher recommendations and these things that I didn't actually audition to get into Berkeley. Mm -hmm. um, but what happens is when you actually arrive to Berkeley, they do some sort of kind of testing your skills for placement. So when I started Berkeley, I did that and the things that were, I think because of that year of music theory and ear training, I was able to get out of some of the, there's a thing at Berkeley that if you can get through, um, pass through some of the basic music theory and ear training, you can kind of advance to some of the other classes. So I started in, you know, skipped over a couple of the ear training and, um, music theory classes. And, um, I think for the guitar audition was playing a standard. I think it was, I played blue bossa or mm -hmm. out of nowhere or something and a little bit of sight reading. My reading was terrible. Um, but now it's much different where it's really competitive, even though when I want, you know, it's still a million guitar players, but it's totally different now where it's really competitive. And I don't think you can even get into the school without auditioning, mm -hmm. but it was, it was different. You know, did you have a band when you were at Berkeley? Did you have your original kind of ideas or your own ambitions to actually be a solo soloist or a sideman? What was your ambition? What was your kind of well, 
environment for hanging out with musicians? Being more sideman or a person that tried to put things together? Well, it's interesting because when I went to Berkeley in the beginning, because I because I grew up just outside of Boston, I didn't live at school, hmm. so I commuted to school, and um, I also needed to pay for school, hmm. so around, I had a couple of really bad jobs, and I quickly fell into, I guess it was in the, it's like in the second half of my first year of Berkeley, I fell into a situation where I started teaching guitar, mm. and all through Berkeley, and through the whole time I was actually in Boston, that grew and grew where I taught a lot, like a lot of it was crazy and I played in bands I played in original bands mostly so I kind of had the Berkeley experience with my friends at Berkeley during the day then I went to teach and then I was playing in original rock bands in the evening well I, not rock bands but I had a band mm. um, and also at the same time I started to kind of put bands together and started to play standards. So it was really, it was an awesome time, but it was really crazy now when I think back about it, because it would start, you know, a lot of, a lot of, you know, college musicians try to put all of their classes later in the day because they're asleep or passed out. But I had all my classes from nine to one because then I had to get to where I taught. And then I would teach from, you know, when high school and junior high kids got out of school till you know seven or eight and then i'd either go to play a gig or band rehearsal and then get home at like midnight and crash and it was yeah it was super fun but it was super crazy now when i think back about it what do you think was the most valuable lesson that you got from berkeley the most valuable lesson from berkeley and i think this is from any music school or when you're in any kind of concentrated musical environment is the program is great, the teachers are great, but the real benefit of that situation is your peers. Mm -hmm. And when you go in the, and I would say like even now, like for instance, a place like Berkeley is very expensive to go to, but the benefit of going to a place like that is the contacts you make and the relationships you develop while you're there. These are the people that are going to go on and be in every facet of the music industry in every major city where music is happening. So that for me, like still, even, even here in Prague, we didn't know each other then, but for instance, there's a drummer here named Martin Schultz, mm -hmm. who we went to Berkeley at the same time. We just never met. Um, Yadimir Hanzak was at Berkeley at the same time I was there, which is, you know, it's such a trip. But, um, I still talk, play with, communicate with, collaborate with people that I went to Berkeley with, even to this day, where I'm constantly talking to these people. So I would say that that, that alone is the magic of a place like Berkeley or any of these music schools. Hmm. Well, if you were to reflect on your whole educational career as a student, as a student, uh, what do you think were the most important moments in your education? And it could have been formal or informal education, any part of it. What do you think were the most important moments or people in your education? Well, I think the most important thing for me was at a certain point in my early 20s um, being called out on my bullshit, basically, uh -huh. <laughs> in the sense that you kind of, we all do this. We all create stories. We all create our own realities, and they're sometimes not inside actual reality. So um, I had one teacher who I didn't study with all that long. His name is Bruce Bartlett. He lives in Boston. He's a great guitar player. Um, he teaches at Berkeley now, but for a long time he didn't teach at Berkeley. 
Um, he taught privately, and he was kind of an outlier kind of in the scene. And a lot of guitar players went to go study with him outside of Berkeley. He was really... Um, he had a lot of things that were attractive to, attractive to people, and they wanted to study those things. And he was ruthless, you know, in the best way. Like, he would just tell you what's really happening, and you'd be like, dude... You know, I just had this, you know, I don't know if he ever said this, but I had the impression that, or I have a memory of him saying this, or, you know, I've created the story in my head, but basically him saying, everything you're saying tells me you want to be a professional musician, but everything I'm hearing out of you tells me you don't. And, and I think that, that that, at that particular point, I don't think that kind of, you know, criticism is good at every point in a young person's development. But I do think there's an important moment where someone's going to tell you the truth mm. of what's happening because, um, otherwise it's kind of not fair. And I think it's, um, you know, it's not as politically correct as it maybe was in my generation. You know, it's everybody's trying to be positive and whatever, but sometimes just the harsh truth of the situation is what you need the most. Mm. And that's what I got from him. So that was one of them. Um, studying with Charlie Benakis, who was a legendary teacher who passed away a few years ago. Um, his students, you know, are a who's who of jazz. Um, he was an amazing person because he taught you how to work. He gave you incredible amounts of stuff to work on. He really um, intuitively knew what you needed to do. He had an exercise or a solution for everything you were trying to do. And he was really hard. He helped you to a high standard, but he was also really loving and encouraging at the same time. So um, it was kind of a perfect balance of someone who was really excited, excited about the music, excited about your possibility, always pushing you, would give you praise when you earned it but also would always remind you that there's more to do. Mm. So that was really, really um, really, um, that was really the, that was a big, that was a really big part about that period of my life of going to Berkeley and kind of learning how to play. And it was an interesting time. Um, Berkeley's an interesting school too. On the other hand, that, um, well, Berkeley's an interesting school because, the time I went there, there's a lot of really, really amazing um, jazz musicians, musicians who played improvised music, who really now are, you know, leading, you know, setting the course of what improvised music is. On the other hand, there's a lot of engineers, there's a lot of session musicians playing in all the various cities, playing on records, writing songs, doing non-jazz music. So it was, um, I think schools kind of go in different periods where there can be concentrations of people that go on to do a lot of interesting things and then it can get quiet for a little while and there's another little wave of people. And I was really lucky in the time that I was at Berkeley. Imagine you're leaving Berkeley and you're starting your career as a working musician. If you were to trace back the bands you were with, was it the cover bands you played in, or most of the time uh, it was quite okay to play in original bands and these bands were able to tour either within one state or two states. How did you get to a point that you are living right now in Prague? Oh, <laughs> so it's a long, a long period. Story. It's a long story. That's a, that's a long story, but um, I guess the... I guess maybe the best way to kind of explain it is uh, um, around the time I left Berkeley, I started to play in an original band that was called Red Time, which um, was a really, really cool, was a really cool band because it was kind of a groove based band and that combined a lot of different types of music that we all love together in a really unique way. So we had this original project, but then beyond it, you know, we we're a band, but it was also kind of like a gang. 
where we also did all of these other kinds of gigs and started to create all these opportunities around Boston. So we had our band, but then we had like a steady straight ahead jazz gig every week that we would do in, uh, just in a bar, hmm. you know, some kind of club. And then we started to do an organ trio gig, and then we started to do some blues gigs. And we just create situations, just go and find places to play and make gigs. And in a way, that last period in Boston before I moved to New York was amazing because at that point in life, you know, we didn't have any responsibilities, and we were working every night, you know, basically making like a hundred dollars a night. And then also on the weekends playing weddings, which I think that that's something that doesn't exist in Europe the same way it does in America. But that's an amazing thing too, because you have to learn a lot of famous songs. You have to play them at an important event, somebody's wedding. And um, there's something about that of showing up, being perfect, starting to learn how to do a gig. Mm learning the music, being cool, putting on a suit, doing it right. So there's that. So you start to learn some of the things that are not about the music also. So we're doing that. So basically, the reason why a lot of us chose to move to New York was at a certain point in our mid-20s, we kind of felt like, you know, Boston had been really good to everybody. We had had a lot of great experiences, but it was time to... um, try to go to the you know not that it's a a better a higher more important level but just to the next level proverbial next level which would mean either moving to a place like los angeles new york or or nashville and i think i was always drawn to the idea of moving to new york city because at my core i kind of just thinking a lot of my favorite favorite musicians all lived in new york Um, It wasn't so far away from where I grew up. And uh, I started to slowly, you know, while I was living in Boston, start to do gigs in New York, and it was a natural progression to move to New York. So that's what I did in 1989. I moved to New York. 1989? No, 1998. Um, um, I moved to New York City. When I moved to New York City, it was great because slowly some of my friends had been coming down there to move to New York, and they kind of paved the way. And then also, um, you know, people were always coming. So we had a community. So it was a great place to move to because it wasn't as hardcore as just moving somewhere where you didn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. So we knew some folks. Pretty quickly, I started to do and for a little while, I spent time going back and forth on weekends to play weddings to have enough money so I didn't have to work, so I could just kind of hang out in New York City during the week and start to kind of understand how everything worked. That was a pretty rough period, but um, but it was worth it. And um, in New York City, I really got my gigging chops together as playing a lot of original music for original artists, playing with singer-songwriters, um, starting to do recording sessions, playing on jingles, playing on records, um, which slowly led me into the studio world of composing music for film and television and commercials and starting to produce records for other people, for other artists. Hmm. So that whole period through New York, which I lived in New York till 2000, like mid 2005. And then that's when I moved to Nashville. Hmm. But yeah, I mean, I could go on and on just about New York. New York was amazing. What was it like to be in Nashville? Nashville's great. I reached a point in my life where um, New York had been great. I'd gone from just moving there, playing guitar, starting to compose, starting to produce, building, a, working at different studios, building my own studio, and uh, um, working with a lot of people I'd always wanted to work with. And it kind of reached a point where lifestyle wise there was starting to be some other things that i was missing which were not really possible in a place like new york city Mm -hmm. um which nashville i went down i mixed a record in nashville and i saw that you could do a lot of the things you could do in new york city 
but then have a different quality of life that's more like, you know, living in the country, living in a smaller, smaller town. And that is possible in Nashville. And that was really, that was really exciting to me. So in 2005, I moved there for the summer and rented a house just to see what it would be like. And then I ended up staying there for another, basically, I don't know, six, almost seven years. Mm -hmm. And um, Nashville was great. When I moved to Nashville, my focus shifted. I had already been shifting more from away from performing. Mm -hmm. I'm one of those people who will go through big periods of time where I may not. There's years where I played like two or three gigs and there's years where I'm playing, you know, four nights a week. And when I get really into heavy, heavy studio mode, I tend to not be playing so much. So when I moved to Nashville, my focus was solely on songwriting, producing, being in the studio. Um, and I was really lucky because I had a publishing deal in New York City, but I was living in Nashville and they sent me all around. They'd send me to LA, they'd send me to Stockholm, they'd send me to London. And I get to work and write songs with all sorts of great people. So that was, that was amazing and work on records. So that was kind of half of my life. The other half of my life, I had a band still in New York that I played in that I'd been playing in. It actually started in Boston, a band called the Brooklyn Boogaloo Blowout, mm -hmm. which was um, made of, uh, was really, really amazing musicians. And um, I would go up there and we would play. And I also, in Nashville, played in bass player Victor Krause's band, which in Nashville, Victor's gig was kind of the only thing in Nashville that reminded me of what living in New York was like. So it was amazing that I, and I had been a big fan of his music before meeting him. So to get to play in his band while I lived in Nashville was all I really needed musically. Hmm. So it's a good balance. So I had this opportunity, and then the rest of my time was spent in the studio. Hmm. You know, for yourself as a guitar player, being in a studio setting, what amp for your, you know, what amplifier, guitar setup, and also the pedals were the ones that are always trustworthy and very faithful and always reliable for you when you were in the studio? Well, I think when you start out, like for someone who's looking to do sessions mm -hmm. as a guitar player, I think the first thing you need to know is your ear in the service industry. It's the same as if you're, you know, a painter or electrician and you're fixing somebody's house, you know, you're providing a service. So from a gear perspective, I think the first thing I think everyone goes through this. The first thing everybody learns to do is how to do the most with the least because they don't have all of these tools. So I would always say, you know, if you only own one amplifier, for instance, you know, you're probably best off owning something like a Fender Deluxe Reverb or mm -hmm. a Princeton. Mm -hmm. Um I think as far as, and this depends on the type of music you're trying to play, but kind of in my world, mm -hmm. having some sort of clean Fender style amp that's kind of a, a base to build a sound off of, like a clean palette, mm -hmm. um, that having, um, I think as far as guitars go, and let, you know, let me back up for a second because there's, there's kind of two ways you can go at the recording guitar player, session guitar player thinking mm -hmm. is one, you just be a personality and it's either the personality somebody wants or it's a personality they don't want. And you just accept that and you just do it the way you see it. The other way is more nuanced where you of course have your own identity and your own thing but you're also trying to cover a wide variety of styles and, you know, be able to bring a lot to the, to the center, to the opportunity. So I would, this one for me, you know, you kind of start off with some sort of good fender, kind of clean fender style tube amp. Um, I would say something like a, 
a Fender Telecaster or a Gibson 335. These these guitars do the most. They can cover the most ground. You know, or you want to have one guitar that's got humbucking pickups and one guitar that's got single coil pickups or whatever. Hmm. As far as effects, you know, you'd need, you know, a few ranges of overdrive from mild overdrive to something that's fully blown out, you know, like a fuzz pedal or something really high gain, mm -hmm. um, a volume pedal, especially in Nashville, um, a delay, and then it goes from there. Mm -hmm. And and again, you know, you kind of go through phases where, you know, at one point at the end of New York and in Nashville, like I remember it, I had, you know, I was carrying trunks and trunks of guitars around. You know, I had, it was... I couldn't even keep track of the guitars they had. Like just changing strings on all of them was a nightmare. But they all had their purpose. They all existed for a reason. It wasn't arbitrary. It wasn't just to have it all. It was each thing. It's like having a different tool for a different reason. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, you start to see a lot of, you know, understanding what things really do, like what a really good Marshall does, like why you would have a Plexi and why you would have like a JCM 800 or why you'd have an AC30, a Fox AC30 versus a Fender Bassman. They, they all do different things that are nuanced. Can you do it all with one amp? Sure, you can. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, you know, once you get into it, it gets really deep and you can get really crazy with it. So um, I went really deep with it for a long time. And I think a lot of people who spend time in the studio do that. But do you need all of those things? yes maybe like it depends on when you which day you ask somebody some days you'd be the answer would be yeah you need all that stuff and some days the answer would be you don't need all of that stuff hmm. but uh, it does have its place hmm. do you remember when you're preparing let's say a recording session with your album let's say daily specials do you remember what kind of routine that you prepare for your band what kind of plan did you have did you have a plan okay for a week we're gonna rehearse and then we're gonna play uh, maybe a couple of shows and then we will make a recording of it or was it the other way around you know you got together had a one session and took it from there what kind of prep work uh, did you have with the guys to record the daily specials well I think that um, I think making a record is a lot like is similar to casting a movie. You know, you need everybody to agree on what they think the color blue is. That way, hmm. you're not um, having basic disagreements over basic things. So the first step is in casting, casting the, casting the crew. Um, in the case of that record, there was no rehearsals. So in that situation, um, there was no rehearsals, and we did basically a day and a half of recording so in my situation i think from my production background um i had a pretty clear idea of yeah i can imagine like when i make a record i leave a little bit of it up to chance but i pretty much know logistically how it's going to go. I have everything be planned in terms of the other thing usually, which this is not what I would want to do, but it's just a necessity financially is I often like for that record, I engineered that record also. Mm -hmm. So I had to be really organized. So like I already went into that situation knowing what the setup would be, what microphones I was going to use. Um, I had an assistant engineer. I had help. But I made the decision sonically of how that was going to be recorded. So I, um, in those types of situ situations, I often, um, I have a really front load the plan. And then there's a big setup period. And then what I try to do is, because basically it's a really bad way to work, but it's just necessary, is I get everything set up. The way, it should, the way I'm imagining it would be and getting everything working and then take a big break, go eat a big, go eat lunch, go like take really like a two hour break and then come back and start working. And in that period, I kind of shift my brain from 
this kind of pragmatic producer thinking to the artist thinking. And then usually I try to have someone who can at least just troubleshoot and keep everything moving forward and make sure nothing's going wrong and just basically capture what's happening. So that was a situation with the Daily Specials record where, you know, we went in, we did a big setup. Um, you know, I had my, I had the charts really made sure the charts were clear, made sure what I wanted people to do was pretty clear, but also leaving some space for them to do their own thing. But that's why I asked them to be involved in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I went about that record. Well, you have also great experience in being a sound engineer, uh, being a producer, you know, so you obviously w work with a lot of people that are coming to you to work with you in a studio. So I wonder now if you're in the chair of being a sound engineer or an assistant or recording engineer, uh, What are the common mistakes that the bands are making in terms of their work and pace? How could they make your work easier if they come up to? Sure. Um, I think I think there's a lot of things you can do outside of the studio to make to ensure that when you're in the studio you get a better result. And um, and this is advice I kind of I give to a lot of people, and people seldom take it, mm -hmm. unfortunately, and then they end up learning the hard way. <laughs> okay. Um, is and there's kind of an old joke. There's a very famous record producer named Phil Ramone, who worked on all the Billy Joel records, Barbra Streisand, really iconic, iconic guy, and um. He always had a joke where people would ask him, well, how long is it going to take me to record my song? And he'd always say, well, how long is your song? And he'd say, well, you know, it's, it's three and a half minutes. He said, well, it's, it's going to take about three and a half minutes to record your song. And then he'd, he'd get a funny look from the people. Mm -hmm. and, and he's right that if you come to the studio and you're not prepared, it's not going to go well. And the reason is the studio is like going to the moon. It's a very foreign environment for most people. They don't have any real life experience in the studio. It's gotten better now for younger people because everyone's got recording programs on their laptops and it's a new world, which is great. But what I always say to people is you need to do the work in the rehearsal space. You need to simulate the best you can what it's going to be like to record your music. So when you get to the studio, it's not going to feel so foreign. So, for instance, some basic things that I think will benefit your recording. If you're playing music that you intend to record with a click, mm -hmm. with a metronome, you should be practicing with the metronome. Maybe not everybody's hearing it. Maybe it's just a drummer. Maybe the drummer and bass player, whatever. But you should, if if you need to know, you should decide what the tempos of your songs are going to be before you go to the studio and get used to practicing those songs at those tempos. You should um, record your rehearsals and analyze them the way a football team or a hockey team looks at the footage of the game they just played before they play the next game to figure out what went well, what's a problem, what are our trouble spots, what are our strengths, and analyze it and start to figure out how to improve the situation. Um, I think that you should have a clear idea if you're a singer. Are you singing in tune? If you're not singing in tune, Are you going to start to use technologies like auto-tune or Melodyne to tune your vocals? That's going to be an additional expense. It's going to take additional time. If you're, um, you know, if you find that the band is speeding up or slowing down in ways you don't want it to, this is all stuff that can be dealt with out of the studio. If you don't have your instruments in good condition, if you don't have the head you want on your drums, and if your guitars are not into or your basses are not set up properly and playing in tune, 
there's not that much somebody can do for you. If you're a drummer and you can't control your own dynamics, the gear is designed to help you do that, but it's not the solution. Mm -hmm. You know, the fastest way to, the fastest way to produce a big change in the studio is from the source and all of the technology. What happens is people, often want all of this technology to solve their problems where the problem needed to be solved by themselves from the get-go and to think about it from this perspective is like the sound that you're going to achieve in the studio is 80 to 90 percent you and that last 20 or 10 percent is going to come from the expertise of the engineer and the space that you're recording in, because different studios have different characters. You want it to be dry without a lot of natural uh, ambience, or do you want to be in like a big church that's got a huge ambience, or do you want to, you know, what is the style mm -hmm. of how you're going to do this? And you should really plan it out, especially if you're on a time limit and a budget limit. Steve, you are in a position of being a teacher and being a guitar teacher, which is quite exciting. Uh, especially nowadays when there's so many video lessons. Uh, you're also writing your own lessons, you're designing your own lessons and preparing your own curriculum. So if you were to put down a list of few books that really helped you, it could be the books that are still being published, it could be the books that are completely uh, non-relevant at the moment of what is happening. What were the books that, or textbooks of methods for guitar players that helped you? Well, I think um, conceptually, I don't know if this is, this is not a good book for a beginner, um, but at a certain point where you start to get serious about understanding how music works and the guitar works, mm -hmm. I still think that Mick Goodrick, the advancing guitarist, is probably one of the best books um, ever written. There's a teacher that teaches at Berkeley named John Damien, mm -hmm. who's amazing, and he's written a couple of great books. Um, I am spacing out on the on the names of the books right now, but basically he's got a thing called the Chord Palette, which is really an interesting concept, and you can Google it. His name's John Damien, mm -hmm. um, and I think he's got two or three books available. Those are great. Um I took a lesson with Ben Maunder. Okay, yeah. Um, basically, he gives you two sheets of paper that tell you everything you need to know, and it's amazing. <laughs> it's really abstract. It's, it's definitely, it's not it's not a beginner-level thing, um, but that's great. The Charlie Parker Omni book, if you're playing jazz, mm -hmm. I think that's just an amazing textbook of music. Um What's that guy's name? Is it is it Andy Levine, the jazz piano book or the jazz oh, theory book? I, I think Mark, Mark Levine. Mark. Mark Levine, yeah. That's a really amazing book. Um, but more important than that, I think it's important to... The fastest way to get better as a musician that i found is once you decide what it is you want to learn or what you like, don't worry about the theory part of it so much. It's just go to the thing that you like and learn it because that's the real music. You need to focus on the technical stuff at certain points, but it's more about feel and the spirit and these other things. And then when you hit those crossroads and you need some technical information, then you can find it. And the fastest way to get the soul and the essence of the music and the vocabulary is to transcribe the things you like. It's the fastest way. And it's going to tell you the truth about the music hmm. because the theory didn't exist before the music. Hmm. Did you encounter any pitfalls or common mistakes or misunderstandings and misassumptions that the students are making? Now we are talking about kind of first year, second year, university level of students for guitar, is there any common pitfalls that they all have in common, common fault, maybe ideas about how the music works or how they should play? Well, yeah, I mean, I made all of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I no, I guess um I don't know. I I think that I think you need to go through that part of it to kind of determine who you know to find who you are. Mm-hmm. I think the one thing that's probably the most useful in in your question is is to know that there's a lot of different ways to accomplish the same thing and your way or your thinking is just one of them. But on the other hand, sometimes you need to have that really strong um, conviction of how it should be, even if you're kind of being a dick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and your um, ego's out of control or you're just completely off base, but you need that conviction to get through whatever it is you're trying to get through. And we been there where this is the real music and this is bullshit and this is this and it's part of the process but looking back on it the more you can be tolerant and to understand that there's a lot of ways to do all of these things and no one way is the right way it it could help you in a lot of it could help you save time it could help you in a lot of ways but I also think there's something about youth, about having a strong opinion about something that has some value. How easy or how difficult it is to start a new life in a new music environment that is completely new when you're building something from scratch? I think of it as a, as a, as a, as a development, as a natural growth, because I feel like even though people at at one point in your life where, you know, really in your life and it, you know, with some consistency, with some, uh, you know, where you saw them a lot or you're, you're making music with them a lot and then you see them less, they don't go away. They're still in your life. Um, and the world we live in now makes it even more possible. Um, I think, I think for myself and, and I got to say that I, maybe I struggle with this a little bit is that, the truth of the matter is I'm more of a process driven person. So for me, there's a lot of things that maybe I not made, whatever there's, there's things that I could have done differently that I think might've helped me professionally in different ways, but because I'm more process driven and experience driven, I follow those tendencies more, even if it is for instance, kind of up to a cruising altitude as a guitar player, like a session guitar player, Mm. and then jumping into the studio or starting to get to a certain level as a composer and jumping into mixing or starting or signing a publishing deal and focusing on songwriting and moving to Nashville or re jumping back into guitar and then moving to another country where there isn't even a, you know, music mecca music industry there at all. Um, those, there's a lot of the, there's a lot inside that Mm. that is not good professional advice to give to somebody. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm a really, I'm a self-directed person, meaning I don't need to be in any of these places to be driven to do whatever it is that I'm curious about or interested at at a given moment. Um, and it and it works. There's some things about it that doesn't work. You know, I, I just a friend of mine, my friend John Deli, who's a keyboard player, said to me the other day. We were talking on Skype and um. He made a really interesting point that a visual artist doesn't have some of these challenges that a a musician has, for instance, where you're um, really dependent on a community, a professional community to build a career off of, where a visual artist can really live in isolation and make whatever it is they're working on. And then that can be brought to market wherever it is. But for a musician, you know, if you're a really, really great bass player or drummer or whatever, and you want to make records and you want to bring your 
drumming ability to support artists, well, you need to be a, in a place where artists need that kind of person. Um, and I think that in moving to Prague was purely based on a lifestyle choice. There was no professional consideration to it. Hmm. Um, it's more about my family. Mm -hmm. It's more about the lifestyle here. It's more... Nowhere is perfect. I think the aspects of European socialism provide a lot more benefits than... Um, than exist in the same way in, in the States, for instance. Mm. For, for example, it, I think more people, a larger percent of the general population have access to the th basic things that they would need in a more socialized system, in a European socialized system, than they would in a more um, capitalistic system like in America. And for us, it just makes sense to have the family here for those reasons, for family reasons, for my wife's extended family mm. and we decided to be here and there's things about my professional career that I struggle with but but I'm so self-directed it's not really an issue mm. it, it get, you know I miss my friends I miss some of my closest musical relationships but you know it's not worth the trade-off okay, thank you very much Steve and good luck with everything good night you too and I'll talk to you soon have a good night mm -hmm.